to the startup grind. Miko is a creative entrepreneur and occasional angel, angel investor focusing on user experience and artificial intelligence. His special interest area is mobile services that utilize contextual data in innovative ways. He currently devotes his time to Linko, a mobile enterprise software startup based in San Francisco, Berlin, and Helsinki. So that's quite an extensive spread out startup. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Prior to that, uh, uh, Miko has founded and built six startups in multiple countries in various, various areas of technology. Out of these, he has so far properly sold three. During his many years of entrepreneurship, he has traveled the planet and lived in Helsinki, London, Berlin, and San Francisco, which means he has a pretty good global network. So it's a good guy to connect with. As a testament to his passion for design and user experience, he's won the coveted Red Dot Design Award. So that should be... I'm very proud of it because I'm one of the rare MBAs who, uh, who have a Red Dot Award. That's awesome. <laughs> so, warm welcome to Miko. Yeah, so hello everyone. I just arrived from Berlin, uh, to which I moved uh, uh, on August. Uh, so it's like two months of uh, trying to learn German. Okay. I guess. It's pretty ambition. Yeah, so we'd like to start these uh, Firestar chats on more of a personal note. So tell us a little bit about where you came from, mm -hmm. your parents, and where you grew up. Yeah, so um, I think I have a very uh, special background for a European person in the sense that I grew up in a, a large family. I was the oldest of 10 kids. Uh, my parents were both academics and PhDs, so uh, very academic upbringing, but at the same time, quite devoted Christian. <coughs> and uh, it created an interesting set, set for, for the childhood because I had to obviously manage with a lot of siblings. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I didn't have this, uh, how do you say, like a shutdown worldview of, 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 uh, of a, uh, uh, the, the typical family which, which would be growing up in the, in a similar setup. So I grew interested about the cultures and, uh, and uh, uh, religions and, and races and uh, like all these differences with, with, between people uh, from early on just because of that, because of this background. <coughs> and uh, and uh, that led into traveling the planet and just learning cultures and learning from different people. And I wanted to live in multiple continents and uh, multiple places to, to really expand my worldviews. And that, that's the same that I'm pushing to my own kids. I have three kids <coughs> and, uh, and uh, on average uh, in their own schools that they have been to so far in different countries, they have had uh, tens of different nationalities always represented in the same schools. So the current school that they are in in Berlin, uh, there's 67 nationalities represented in the school. So it's quite incredible breadth of, of uh, exposure to different uh, worldviews. Uh, and I think that's the best platform for having an open mind. And uh, uh, for a creative person, I think the most creative companies and creative people come from environments where there's lots of diversity. Uh, the diversity pushes creativity. Uh, you see and you see some clashing ideas to what you learned yourself when you were a kid and something and that leads into new ideas. And uh, that's why the best startup pops in the world are the ones where all these uh, cultures of the world mingle and feel feel like they can mingle in peace and, and be friends, no matter what the disputes with the countries may be. So, and as, as a kid, did you already notice an entrepreneurial spirit? Did you already... So my, my dad was an inventor. Um, he was an electrical engineer and then uh, obviously educated signal processing for the local telecom and Nokia guys in, in Finland uh, uh, as a professor. Uh, so I was definitely... Uh, I mean, I had the engineering mindset as a kid. And... and uh, this engineering mindset, uh, my dad also founded a few companies and he sold a couple. So there was this academic combined to entrepreneurial uh, background. Uh, so one of the things I learned during this uh, childhood years was, was that, that, that uh, it was always the business guys who seemed to make all the money out of these startups that my dad did. And he'd only got a smaller portion of it. And so I wanted to go to business school because I wanted to be in charge. So that's how I ended up in business school. <laughs> What's but I really wanted to study engineering, and I feel like I'm more of an engineer on my mindset. More of a hands-on. I really like to create new things. Yeah. And so the, the name of the town where you're born, how do you pronounce that? Oulu. Oulu. Yeah. Oulu. Uh, there's an interesting um, note about that. It says that it's considered one of Europe's living labs. 
Did you know that? Well, I mean, there's lots we're of residents, technology. Yeah, technology. it says we're residents experiment with new technology all the time. So that's that's is that more now or was it back then also? It was back then also. Yeah, very so creative, the city itself. Um, there was lots of engineers, okay. I would say. Uh, I'm not sure about the like. Uh, I look at Finland as as country where there's lots of good engineers and there's lots of good marketers and salespeople, but there's not very many good product people, and and. This lack of product expertise in the country is always interpreted as lack of marketing and sales skills. And, and uh, because, because when you have technology and you have sales, but you do not have products, uh, uh, then it's always like the salespeople blaming the engineers for doing bad job and the engineers blaming the salespeople for not selling their stuff. Uh, but the fact is that the product is the solution to the problem. And, and uh, uh, when you have a small country, I think it's probably the same in Switzerland. Uh, it's small enough as a country that whenever you create a product that is small enough to, to, to compete on the world scale, it already diminishes the local market size to so small market that, that you cannot thrive in your own home market anymore. Mm -hmm. So the only way of creating product businesses is to do born global startups. The problem is that there's not people, when I mean, there's not critical mass of people who already did that before and already made themselves wealthy with it, uh, you do not have the expertise, you don't have the funding, because nobody will take the risk of, of doing Born Global. You know, you don't have the access to these things. Uh, so that eventually led me out of the country as well. I, I felt like I was not able to realize my biggest product ideas because I felt like I was the product person. And I felt like uh, people won't understand products in, a, in a, such a small setup. So investors and, and, uh, and the folks in the ecosystem felt like uh, limiting. And as soon as I moved out of the country, I, I started having a lot more success with my product approaches as well. So I, I felt like it was it made a definite difference mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, so while as uh, I'm not anti Finland or anti Switzerland or anything else, I, I feel that I'm more like a cosmopolitan global citizen. Uh, I do not wave any flag of any specific place. I feel like we are all in this together and, uh, and there shouldn't be any comp competition between nations, but rather uh, well, I would say like a, this world is our our home, yeah. you know, in that sense. For sure. And so um, family is very important to you. You're a father of three kids. Mm -hmm. how, do, how does that tie in with your entrepreneurship and, and your journey as an entrepreneur and launching startups? And, you know, it's, it's I'm, as many people here know, startup mm -hmm. life is not the coziest. Yeah. How does that interact with, with your family? Well, first of all, you have to obviously have a significant someone who supports your right like a willingness to be an entrepreneur and and uh, that I already read it uh, when I was dating my wife uh, I said to her that I'm going to be an entrepreneur I'm going to travel the planet and and uh, and uh, we are going to be in lots of places uh, and if you don't agree to these terms uh, maybe we should continue our dating and and well she she said okay that's fine let's let's go with it and then we've been doing that uh, Mm -hmm. But so she's been very supportive for this. Uh, uh, well, obviously, uh, for, I've been. For, you just had your fifteenth anniversary, right? A few months ago. Yeah. So uh, if I look, I was I was obviously young when I got when I got married, uh, but I already had graduated from uh, from business school and had worked for as an executive at Nokia for some years. So I just did it everything a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. I moved out of my uh, home when I was sixteen and, uh, and uh, lived alone since that like by myself so I felt like I was grown up already much earlier than many other people will mm. think they are and and uh, the obviously contributing factor was that my dad wasn't really let's say against me moving out of the home because we had a lot of kids there you know so <laughs> <laughs> he actually facilitated for the oldest ones to leave home early so it's more space but uh, but uh, the thing is that that uh, that uh, initially when I was building my first startup you know I was obviously like dirt poor uh, entrepreneur as an entrepreneur taking nothing out and it, it took some guts to do that right now when when you have some comfort level and you know you have some exits behind it it's a completely different story it's more mm -hmm. like uh, enjoying the freedom of, of uh, being able to do things that you really want to do and, uh, and so it's it's a different setup now so I, I would say more comfortable mm -hmm. yeah for sure and the kids have been enjoying the moving around it's funny, but you know, when you travel, when you have, when the kids are used to basically uh, uh, going to different countries and meeting different people and networking with uh, lots of different cultures, uh, we go on family vacation in summertime and they, they see some nice place where there's a nice skate park. They say, "Hey, there's an awesome skate park. Let's move here." <laughs> well, 
maybe that's not the <laughs> whole picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> does uh, Arnie, your son, does he still make cakes? Oh, you you looked from the Facebook. I saw some very interesting. Uh, yeah, that he likes making cake. Is that still? Does he? Did he make your anniversary cake? <laughs> no, no. So he's. Um, I mean, I'm pushing my kids to to be creative and trying to do like learn new things. And uh, my wife makes cakes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and she does that uh, as a. I don't think business hobby, but yeah. <laughs> right now, <laughs> right now, my my sons go to. Uh, like uh, parkour classes, and they call it the ninja school because <laughs> because they really do some ninja moves there. Yeah. So so uh, uh, we still are looking for the soccer team in Berlin to for them to join because because they played soccer both in the United States and in Finland before this. Okay. Uh, but we'll see if, if if they actually get more excited about this mm. ninja thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know. I mean, everyone knows that the Finns love saunas. It's just more, you know, a lighter question, not related to entrepreneurship, but more to you personally. Have you found some nice sauna places in Berlin, or is actually I have a? Um... Would you have to fly back to Finland too? No, no. So, so <laughs> I was thinking of of setting up a a portable sauna on the on the on this like a rooftop uh, patio of our penthouse office yeah so we'll see because there's a couple of things there and then i think the rest of the engineers will like that as well for sure so i've read that it's something that the fans believe deeply in and it's very um nourishing and and you know re rejuvenating it's something very that they look as on as a health benefit not the so thing is that, that my my dad once said that that, that uh, he always gets the most creative mood in sauna so mm -hmm. so uh then he got lots of ideas about how to improve the sauna well I mean as an engineer and then he went to the patent office in Finland and realized that everybody else has the same trade so there's a crazy amount of sauna patents in Finland yeah. <laughs> up and he came to the conclusion that maybe he had to get the mood to invent something else than sauna related stuff <laughs> sauna. Yeah. but yeah it, it puts you sometimes in a creative mood like mm -hmm. finding out new ideas nice what do you find are the key differences um, in creating a startup between Europe and the U.S. since you've been... Did you actually uh, start up in the U.S. as well? Oh, yeah. I founded startups in, in uh, currently, I think, four different countries. Okay. Uh, so I founded uh, companies in Finland, Poland, Germany, and the United States. Uh, so, well, uh, don't ask me, but uh, I'm never going to find a company in Poland anymore. <laughs> it's, it's too complicated, too much bureaucracy, and too much uh, all these uh, other things that it doesn't really help you doing that. Uh, but I really like uh, working with Polish engineers. I'm, I'm, so we have a few of them in our team, and it's it's awesome. But uh, uh, I'm learning now because because I'm setting up a, a German entity for our US Inc. Uh, obviously, because we're operating. Uh, I started that process on finding like all the service providers and all these like different helpers. And it looks to be incredibly complicated process in Germany. Like okay. I mean, there's all kinds of bureaucracy layers, and you know, and it, it 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 is not easy. Uh, in some countries like Estonia, you just go in and file papers and boom, you're done. You know, and you use electronic cards, everything is electronic, you never file any papers. Some other countries like like a lot to deal with paper. <coughs> uh, US and Finland are very nice from the perspective that, that most of the stuff you can currently do online for anything you want to do. And uh, for me, as a global citizen who spends time in different places and things, I really like electronic. Uh, so. I have a deal with my uh, our accounting company in Finland that every receipt that they ever get will they will get into their Dropbox uh, from me. So we have a shared Dropbox. I just drop an image of any receipt that I have, and that electronic receipt is enough in Finland. So I can scrap the receipts right after it. So I just basically they do something and take a photo of the receipt and scrap it, and everything is fine because they have a Dropbox copy of it, and it will be fine as as, as a bookkeeping. Some countries don't accept that, mm -hmm. so so you are stuck with all kinds of stupid procedures. I heard that some people are using faxes in Germany. Like, uh, I'm like, well, what's that? I remember my dad used it in the 80s, maybe. So in actually founding a company other than the paperwork, um, is there any other significant difference that you found? Oh, yeah. So um, on the cultural level, um, for example, in Germany, um, the GMP, GmbH, as they say, uh, requires 25,000 euro initial investment. So it's very capital intensive in that sense. In the US, you can set up a corporation with one dollar. It doesn't really like uh, require you to have any specific amount of capital or any any other like structural complications. Even the UG thing that is going on right now in in, in Germany, it's just like a temporary solution for getting you into GmbH. Uh, 
and 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 so I don't think Germany really understands their like uh, agile, fast moving, low low capital, uh, lots of knowledge type of startups. It's not geared to that. It's more like you set up a manufacturing unit and you have to have a healthy balance sheet because 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 you are doing lots of investments and you are a credible member of the of the community only if you have that. But I think it's slowing people down. Mm -hmm. I heard from uh, entrepreneurs that you don't even get the credit card for your company until you have a two years of credit history for the company. So I said that in the US, like Instagram guys who sold it in 18 months from the founding, they wouldn't even get the credit card before they already sold it for a billion. So like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because in the US, the company started like this. You know, you set up a company and, and you basically rack up your credit card debts until, until you find somebody to put some funding on it. And uh, you just take 10 different credit cards and when all of them are maxed out, then you ask from your dad and then you ask from your cousin and then you ask from your rich uncle in Montana and then you, after that you go into the angel investors and stuff. That's a very typical way of funding stuff there. And so it's very it's like flexible and agile from that perspective. Uh, no complications. <laughs> and um, from a mindset perspective or a cultural perspective, what do you think uh, startups in Europe could learn from the startups in the US? Yeah, so lots of the ambitious Europeans go in the Silicon Valley to start, to start their startups there. So obviously what, what happens in Silicon Valley is not a specific representation of what the US is. It's the Silicon Valley thing. You know, Silicon Valley thing is the global hotpot of entrepreneurs where entrepreneurs from all over the world come into this one place to, to, to pursue their dreams. And lots of them will fail, but it's more like a, like a, you feel like you're part of a community that, that is trying to do things. And it, it feels good, even if you sometimes struggle and I think it feels good to be connected to this, this community of people who really want to achieve something. And there's lots of people who have dropped out all kinds of backgrounds, like a, they drop, dropped out of being a professor in a university, they drop out of being an executive at the corporation, and then they move into like some garage and then do things and scrappy way and then eat the egos and then eat the, everything that and that that's that's really nice i i really like the fact that you don't go there and say that i'm the head doctor professor or, uh, somebody like in, in germany oftentimes people like to be called that. so so it's more like a, uh, i used to be a doctor in in sweden or i used to be something in there and but now i'm an entrepreneur here and i'm trying this thing out but it hasn't worked yet but maybe it will work next week and you know stuff like that by the way, if during the course of the conversation someone has a question, feel free to let me know. We'll... So, for example, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't like to name job in specifically, but uh, the incredible accessibility of Silicon Valley has has been proven to me multiple times over. So, I mean, I met Mike Arrington at the at the pub in Palo Alto before he even started TechCrunch blog, and was playing with uh, arcade games with him and Kate Thier, who was his uh, business partner in Archimedes Ventures and other thing. I also met with Mark Zuckerberg because he came to talk to me at one of the events there. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, with uh, Drew Houston, you know, I was sitting on a dinner next to him. And, you know, there's, there's all these, like, things that you meet these people. And, you know, they, it's, they are the same thing. They're doing things. Some of these people will eventually become super rich or, or famous or, or something else. But when they're doing it, they're just like anybody else at mm -hmm. the moment. You know, it's just... Yeah. Some of them will fly, some of them will have multiple failures of, and eventually some, some folks will succeed and you know you never know who is going to make it and who is not necessarily in the, in the first place. And from the investor side, what's your, what got you into investing? For example, you invested in, in Walkbase. Yeah, so um, I mean, once you've done What's the story behind Walkbase? How did you get inspired well, about that? I, I was helping them as an advisor uh, to, to figure out the product. Uh, they had a technology in uh, indoor positioning and we basically went to I went with them to Silicon Valley. I spent a lot of time with the CEO uh, who became personal friend during that time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, it led into this, these things like it led into investment and, and uh, being engaged. Now the company is just about to close its uh, Series A funding, um, which obviously makes my investment look really good right now. So I'm happy with that one. Do you have a criteria um, for investing? What's something specific that you look for? I want to be able to contribute to the idea. Like, uh, I mean, I have some really good product. More product than just putting in money, you want to actually engage yeah, in the because, company. Because, I mean, because uh, yeah, it, it's what entrepreneurs want to do. You want to spend your time with things that are interesting to you. Uh, so, 
And what advice would you give to, because there's a lot of people obviously wanting to start something and um, one of the prerequisites, not always, but one of the major requisites is, is investing in funding. Um, so what advice would you get for people who are looking for, for funding? I think I think uh, the main thing that I've learned over these years, and I, I learned it quite late in the process, and you know, like I'm I'm just I'm still learning it basically, is that that main thing you need to focus on is removing the friction, and remove the friction from from your pitch, from your product, from your sales, like from all of the fronts. And I help a friend of mine uh, um, as an advisor in to to basically from nothing to a, a thirty million euro exit in Finland in eighteen months, and. Uh, I was witnessing the process of how you remove friction really in the true way. And, and uh, the friction means in this case that this, this uh, the guy joined the company as a VP of sales and a co-founder when it had the product ready, but it didn't have a like uh, functioning sales yet. It was just a product. And uh, he built a sales organization for it and he built a pitch and, and how it was pitched and the value proposition. And the end result was that, that over this course of 18 months, 92% uh, of all the offers that they made led into a contract. So they made over 1,200 customer agreements during the 18 months period. Uh, so you can say that there was practically no friction on the, on the sales. Like if 92% of all the offers that you sent will close, you know, it's like you get a salesperson who loses some of the deals, you can fire them because they cannot get all of them. And, and and uh, and that was actually some concern sometimes that if you have a salesperson who converts only at fifty percent rate, you know maybe it's too bad. Like I mean, maybe you should find somebody who goes with a higher percentage. And and uh, uh, that led into a, a I said a thirty million euro exit in eighteen months, which is obviously in Europe nice. You know, it's Silicon Valley standard. It's a it's a neat little thing, but you know, I, I think it's awesome. And he's twenty seven, so he's definitely happy with the outcome. You know. Yeah. Being able to retire before thirty, and from that perspective, but 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 um, the friction in this case means that that the, how I applied uh, these learnings, uh, for example, on Linko, uh, we had a uh, the first seed round just with the PowerPoint uh, uh, last August, and uh, and uh, basically we had a few contacts with a few folks that we felt like were relevant for this business and and, and good advisors at the same time as investors. Mm -hmm. And we close it with uh, just a few phone calls. The seed funding route had absolutely no friction from that perspective. And, and it was very quickly raised and there was no problems. And then we started developing the first version of the product. We just uh, closed our seed funding, which was $2 million. And uh, it also came together in, uh, uh, I think, uh, the all, all together about 10 weeks, uh, if you count it. Mm -hmm. And... and, uh, and uh, in this round, uh, we also made uh, rules that, that uh, we keep all the votes for all the shares that are invested. So none of the investors who came in got any votes in the, in the, in the company. So uh, from that perspective, uh, I think uh, it was awesome. Like, uh, and, but I think we are doing the right things now. And then uh, we, are, we are the pitch that works. And, you know, and on our current customer meetings, we still do not have the product uh, shipping in the true sense of... of, of uh, of having it, uh, having it uh, rolled out to lots of users. Uh, we have only a few initial test customers that are currently uh, running it. Uh, but we have currently so many customers lined up, paying customers, uh, at this point that we are instantly profitable when we start ship. So uh, and we are getting currently approximately three new customers a day mm -hmm. uh, for the product that we are doing uh, without any marketing whatsoever, not spending a penny to marketing so yeah. far. Uh, if you don't count the spending time on some some website, you know that they put out, but uh, but uh, I think uh, so far I'm feeling confident that, that this whole concept of removing the friction is is really awesome and it's possible to optimize everything to a point that that you you know already before you even build the product that this is going to succeed because 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 the pitch that you created and the, and the business model that you put on it and and the, and the and the concept of how you create value for the customers is, is, is right. So removing the friction, in other words, simplifying, simplifying your presentation. It can be in multiple places. This is, this is the, probably the most, most complex part of this concept. The most complex part is to understand where the friction is. So when you go to customer, you know, so for example, in our case, we iterated our pitch for the, for the whole first year. When we did the initial PowerPoint, that, which we raised in a few phone calls, we raised the initial 400K. 
uh, last year. Um, uh, from there on, we continued iterating the pitch and then iterating the like value proposition and then changing the business model and mm-hmm. uh, changing the product scope and everything. Else. It's basically going to these meetings and then meeting with real users, real customers, and understanding like like uh, how do you get to a point that that this customer or this user of the product uh, gets a value proposition where he he or she feels that that this product is creating more value than I'm paying for as soon as possible from the beginning of the meeting. So we measured also the time, like how long like it takes for us to convert this customer into yeah. saying that, yes, I want this and I want to, I want to pay for it. And uh, it's seven minutes now. Like, uh, I think it's pretty good. Uh, Sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. It's almost an ele- There was a few, few clients that we signed so that, that we forgot to tell them the price and they signed anyway. And then, then we came back later. Like, oh, sorry, we forgot to tell you how much this costs. No, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. But, so, so removing the friction. Yeah, it's, it's as I said, you know, it, it sounds like, like uh, from this way, it's just uh, something to focus on. Because, because it's very easy to focus on like, okay, I get passionate about this new chair product. And, and then, then you build it and then you try to start looking for customers for it. But uh, oftentimes, you know, you get wrong many things. You get wrong like, like what the real problem is. Mm-hmm. You get wrong what the real business model that creates value is. You get wrong how to present the product, like the, the story of the product. You get wrong who the customer is. And, and every time you can blame some component of the equation, you can blame the engineers are bad or the salespeople are bad or something. This is about the product. I'm saying about like how you solve a real problem in, in, this, in this equation. Right. And if the pitch is done in a way that, that you have solved the problem in the pitch, that everybody can see. When you see it, you, you get convinced as an investor that, oh, this guy's really figured it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think even for a first-time entrepreneur, the fundraising will be much easier. But oftentimes, even if you look like uh, Berlin is a hot startup hub right now, most of the startups that I've seen so far haven't figured it out. They still get funded because there's lots of funding available, I guess. But, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's crucial, you know, to be successful with this uh, is to basically find the sources of friction and removing them. All right. And um, do you have a mentor in your journey, in your entrepreneur's journey, or over the years of- I've had many. Uh, the first, uh, like, uh, big mentor for me was was Bill Paulin. He was a uh, old guy from San Diego uh, who educated me how to do business in the United States. That was, uh, I think, we first met in year two thousand, already, thirteen years back. And uh, he came as a, I mean, he joined as a board member for my first company. He took me to the several of these trips to the U.S., where we had meetings with customers and and, and partners. And then after the meetings, we always had feedback sessions where he told me what I did wrong and what I did right, and mm-hmm. you know, and how how did it go, and how he felt like about the about the uh, uh, expressions of the of the people because you can, local people can obviously read the expressions better than I can. Like I, I can interpret some expressions of American customers as, as positive, even though they're <laughs> negative, and so on. And there's always this like, he said, yeah, this is awesome. Like uh, let's let's meet again, and this is awesome. And it may mean that fuck you, basically. I mean, it's like I don't, I'm not interested at all. Uh, but how do you know that? Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, you have to start learn to read this uh, between the lines and see that if there's really interest or if this just being cordial, you know, being friendly. <laughs> you came all the way from the other side of the ocean. Now I don't want to really make you feel bad. <laughs> and do you think it's important for an entrepreneur to have a mentor, or how important? Run, What's the level? Yeah, of this is this is this is very good point. Uh, I ran a mentorship program at the, at the business school when I, when I attended it because I felt that uh, you can only be as good as your teacher. You know? And I, I felt like uh, the best teachers are the people who already were in the front line and did those things. And uh, I got uh, a lot of the, uh, my student colleagues, uh, mentors from, uh, from large company executives and, and, uh, and uh, startup entrepreneurs. And many of them got employed in the companies that they were being mentored at. Mm-hmm. So it improved their employability a lot. Um, so it was it was very uh, educational experience and it was it was interesting and I think it's it's uh, definitely very valuable to have different worldviews and different points of view to to put in the mix because you may have some stubborn <coughs> stubborn ideas that are stupid and you know you want to get corrected mm-hmm. and oftentimes the mentors learn themselves as well I mean I'm getting to an age now that that, that I feel like I'm learning from the younger guys so. 
Well, you've been quoted as saying, when I was a kid, one of my biggest wishes was to become wise as I get older. Do you feel that's the case? Yes, yes, <laughs> I definitely uh, was was uh, a right choice to make. And uh, uh, they say in, in Finnish as well that, that, that uh, knowledge increases pain. And uh, uh, I think that's true too. So you start seeing a big picture by studying different cultures and, and different, and you start finding out that not everything that you thought was said a specific way wasn't. That, I mean, that some things are are and continue to be evil in this planet, and you know you cannot stop that, and you mm -hmm. have to accept that. And the understanding of, of those things uh, uh, makes it sometimes painful, but at the same time, uh, having perspective on things, and especially in my in my case, uh, I attribute a lot of the wisdom into emotional intelligence. I got very interested about emotional intelligence because of my childhood and and uh, how different things like uh, you feel this compassion of your uh, of your uh, how do I say like uh, uh, fellow church members but you cannot you, you are told that you cannot feel the same compassion to other people and then then you still feel that compassion and you you start questioning yourself like uh, uh, that that, that uh, what is wrong with this model and uh, how do you how do you should um, change and then then that led into into this big study of emotional intelligence and one of these things is to be able to humble yourself to to put yourself in the same same line with everybody else and not putting yourself on pedestal and it's very easy to grow a big ego and and, and put yourself on pedestal and think that you are better than anybody else and mm -hmm. and get stubborn with your ideas because you think your ideas are better than everybody else's ideas but uh, if you can keep yourself in the, in the in the learning mode and and uh, and uh, I mean humbling doesn't mean that you cannot be ambitious, but you know mm -hmm. meaning that that you understand that you cannot know everything and mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you can learn from others and and, and uh, you don't have to necessarily uh, as an entrepreneur CEO you don't have to make yourself the best paid person in your company and and uh, and uh, so on and things like that. Uh, um, there is this big topic that in, in the States the uh, failure of a startup is kind of celebrated, whereas in Europe a uh, failure is, uh, is a mark that you have for a lifetime. Uh, can you confirm this or maybe through inside dialogues with investors you can say there is... So uh, I, I would not say that it's celebrated, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, but the Ilka Panen and the Finnish entrepreneur who is currently probably the hottest entrepreneur in Europe right now because of this uh, massive uh, 1.1 billion euro uh, semi-exit that he made for Supercell. Uh, he says that, that they celebrate uh, failures with champagne and then uh, success with beer. Uh, so so uh, uh, it's not celebrated in the sense that, that, that you celebrate for, for a, lo a loss or, or failure, but uh, it's not uh, a bad thing that you failed. Like uh, if you put it in a CV that you built a company that didn't succeed, it's okay. It's perfectly okay to say that this company didn't go anywhere, and uh, and uh, it won't be uh, hurting your future employability that you failed with your startup. So it's not like specifically celebration celebration of it, but it's uh, not hurting you either. So, but do you see it in Europe is really bad still? It gives you a bad reputation. Is it getting better? Have you spoken with investors about this in Europe? I actually see a uh, myself. I see entrepreneurs who failed with their first startups being funded more on the second one. So I I wouldn't say that there's a specific trend up of uh, uh, unsuccessful entrepreneurs being rejected by the investors. Uh, it may be so that that some of these entrepreneurs, if they fail for reasons that are do not uh, let's say stand the light of the I mean light of the day maybe maybe then you know if you don't have a reputation as a trustworthy person on the on the system then it's different but if you honestly tried your best and then the company failed it doesn't necessarily put you in the governments do not understand that yet so many countries in Europe actually put you in some kind of debt program for several years after if you if you fail and you incur debts for the company uh, so that's really bad because because uh, that puts a lot of capable people out of the business for a long time. So 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 from a, I mean I, I cannot say speak for Swiss people or because um, I don't understand like the local culture here well enough. I do not have history in living here to to tell about this. But uh, 
let's say my experiences in Berlin and Helsinki, which definitely both are startup hubs at the current moment, uh, uh, I see entrepreneurs who failed before being funded again. So maybe that answers your question. I know people personally who have been funded after failure. So, okay. so with all the, dirt, all, the, all the positive comments you made about Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. why did you move out of there to Berlin? Uh, yeah, so I left Silicon Valley uh, uh, in 2011, early 2011, because uh, I didn't get extension for my startup visa. So I was fired from the country, basically. Okay. I didn't willfully leave the country. I, I had to move. So I'm victim of this so-called like startup visa problem that they currently have. Multiple more entrepreneurs I know who have been in the same situation. Okay. So do you see any, uh, because there are many advantages of Silicon Valley specifically and US in general over Europe, are there any advantages of Europe over US that you could see? It's a good question. Um, I mean, from uh, from uh, I mean, so one of the things that, that uh, Europe has, good, I mean, let's let's say, I mean, again, I can speak for Finland. Uh, one of the things that is at the same time benefit and drawback of the country, people are very relaxed. I mean, they feel like they're taken care of. They have long vacations and then the short days, and you know, and good pay for for minimal amount of uh, of uh, like stress. Uh, so I don't see many stressed people there. Like I mean, it's mostly like so. I'm 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 trying to think about it like uh, from the perspective of where they are. So you don't have to be like uh, this uh, multi-billionaire entrepreneur to be stress. I mean, stressless person. You can be stressless person as pretty much anything, and. Maybe that's a good thing, you know, look at the happiness charge and all these other things, it's, it's great for the countries. But I don't think it increases the competitiveness of the, of the societies very well. Because, because then you have, you have to compete against uh, Koreans who are working uh, 11 hours a day for 6 days a week. Uh, and constantly innovate and constantly push themselves. They are not happy. If you look at the happiness charge, they are actually much, much unhappier than, than Scandinavian people. But at the same time, they get more results done. So, so you have this... Uh, dilemma of, of choosing between whether you want to have a happy, happy society that is maybe over time eroding with the competitiveness. Uh, if the innovativeness of the, of the society is big enough and there's, uh, like I said, some catalyst for, for successful businesses independent of the fact that you work less, uh, then it's probably okay. Because the innovation can make it you so successful that you don't have to work hard and you can still make money uh, as, 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 as a society. And there are now some examples in Finland for that, like Supercell, you know, they, don't, they do not have long working days there. They work from 9 to 5, like usual Finns, and they have all the vacations that they want to take, and, you know, so... Lucky for them, you know, they still were successful, you know, mm -hmm. to the tune of the Silicon Valley standards. Yeah. Back, back to the previous topic, um, as we know, most entrepreneurs at some point in time have uh, a failure in, in their entrepreneurial mm -hmm. path. Have you experienced um, a failure in, in a business failure, and how how did that happen? What did you what did you learn from that? Yeah, so um, I want to tell one story from the early days of my entrepreneurial career, and this was uh, year two thousand. Um, I have to put as a background this uh, because uh, as a as a backgrounder, uh, at the time I was still somewhat religious person uh, in the sense that I, I was Christian. I wasn't a fundamentalist Christian necessarily, but I was still a Christian. Okay, so. Uh, now I'm an agnostic, so I'm I'm not looking at this as a, as a re, like I said as a religious experience specifically, but but it, it's an interesting story anyway. Uh, so it was November 2000, and I I mean I was really lucky. I mean I was uh, top of my class from business school, and then I got lots of job offers from different companies, and 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 uh, I took a, a job at Nokia uh, on the executive training program, which is one of the most prestigious jobs you can ever have as an MBA in Finland, and then. Moving to that, that and uh, having a fast career at Nokia, in year 2000 I left because, because I got lots of phone calls because of the dot-com boom times uh, from different investors who said that we heard that you may be setting up a company, we want to fund it. And uh, I said, I have no idea for a company yet, but they said, it's okay when you have, just call us and we will give you money. And then I'm like, okay, well, that sounds quite uh, easy. <laughs> and then uh, on... Uh, October to uh, like 99, I, I then called actually um, uh, one of these guys who called me and said that when, once you have an idea, I said, now I want to become an entrepreneur. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, do you have an idea? I said, not yet, but I want to become an entrepreneur. He's like, okay, send us a pitch and then you know, and we'll, we'll take care of it. 
So I put together like uh, this this uh, pitch for a software company. Uh, I think it, I took two weeks to do it or something. And then I sh submitted the pitch. And then uh, once I've submitted it, I got instantly funded. And it's like, whoa, this is like, no, now I need to resign from this job and, you know, start being an entrepreneur. And then, uh, so I, I had some resign the period because because uh, the job was having, so I, I actually quit in March 2000. And and uh, it was right at the peak. I mean, if you think, look at the dot com, like the stock exchange cards, like it was right in the peak of the peak that I quit. And there was a celebration. I remember the celebration of Nokia saying that that, that Mikko is doing what the, all of us are dreaming about. He's going to be a startup entrepreneur, and he's a, has a funded startup, and he's now going to be doing some cool stuff, you know. And then, okay, so next thing happens in in April. Uh, uh, there was this list in in the local business paper in Finland, uh, the top hundred IT innovators in Finland, and uh, that list. Uh, listed me as well but the list was not ordered by by like rank but by name hmm. and my surname started with a so i'm number one on the list <laughs> so i i i basically like uh quit a nokia at the top of the boom and being celebrated as an entrepreneur before i even had done anything as an entrepreneur and then i get on the top list like uh, everybody congratulate me as the top it innovator and just like five days to my entrepreneurial career so everything possible like from that perspective looks awesome okay it doesn't help when you have when you're a young guy and you have a big ego and you just out of business school and you know i mean you've been doing some fast career at nokia and then go so well uh, it was it was super it looked everything looked super easy okay and then obviously everything crashes the dot com boom you know comes in everything else comes in uh, i lose a fight with my i i do some sales for the product for a startup and uh with customers and i i sign deals but then my engineer co-founder said that this this product that we created is crap we don't want to ship it I'm like well but i already sold this and you know we need to ship it you know you can't now quit but we, we, we just did this and then and uh uh, after a while, you know, I basically find out that I, I cannot fight. I mean, I lost the fight. I, I couldn't. So two, there was three co-founders and, you know, I was the business guy and there was two engineers. So I lost the fight to the engineers because there was two against one. And they just refused to ship it. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, so when, when can you ship a product that, that they release? I have to go back to the customers and renegotiate. And, and uh, 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 OK, so they come back and say, OK, it takes two months to fix this product. And then I re redevelop it. So I go to customers and I've been negotiate for two months of extension of the time and so on. Well, six months later, you know, everything is still down the toilet. Nothing has been completed. Right. Our money has been run out. Obviously, we spent the money to engineering and nothing has been, I mean, we all are naive young guys who, who really, like, uh, don't understand, like, what it takes to get things done. And obviously, the customers are already at the point of breaking and saying, screw that, I don't want to wait. I mean, you cannot get anything done and all that, all that stuff. And then we ran out of money as well. So uh, it's the November night and uh, we're sitting at the office uh, with uh, one of my co-founders and we are looking at each other in the evening. It's Wednesday. I remember this very, very vividly. Uh, so it's Wednesday and we sit and look at each other and say, okay, we had this funding round open for a month and you know it's going to close on, on Friday and we have to fire everybody on Friday if we don't have the funding because, because we are running out of money in mid-December end of November time frame. There was no commitments in the funding and uh, it looked really bad. Like I said, like we, we're looking at each other and say like we are total absolute failures. Like we, we cannot you know, get anything done. With it. It's basically like biz heads who, who tried to do something and it was incredibly humbling and then you know and uh, we were angry to ourselves that we were so bad and you know we were such a incredible flame out in our own opinion and I said you know it's a big like a uh, ranting to ourselves like how bad we are. And then we say, okay, well, there's nothing we can do anymore. It's Wednesday and Friday, we have to fire everybody. So, okay, then, then I look at him and say, okay, I'll pray. Like, I mean, that's the only thing I can do anymore. And uh, so I go home and I pray and uh, he prays as well. And, and the next morning we come to the office and uh, we are sipping the coffee and looking at each other and again, like, did you pray? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then feeling bad about ourselves. Let's knock in the door. <coughs> And uh, a wealthy person uh, who just had exited his company in the local town in Finland uh, comes in and says, I got the feeling I want to invest in your company, uh, but I want to be a chairman of the board. I'm like, yeah, 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 you can <laughs> be, be a god, you know, I don't care. Like, <laughs> whatever, whatever you say. 
Okay, so then there's like, okay, the guy says, okay, I'm almost 200,000. I'm like, okay, so so can we tell this to everybody else that who has been there, like, in this negotiation? Yeah, sure. So I sent this message to everybody who we had been talking to on the funding round. And everybody invests. So suddenly by Friday, we have the whole funding round closed. And it didn't make me feel like egotistical or proud or even celebratory. It made me feel incredibly humble because, because I realized that, that no matter what I do and what, whatever, like who I am, you know, it, it's not always in my own hands how, what, what happens to these things. Like, I mean, there's all kinds of outside factors that, that, that affect these businesses. But you can trust that we really, really pushed hard after that. Like we felt like, like that we had been just like, a, like flying with the wind of dot-com boom, you know, being that egotistical, like a, in our own opinion, cool entrepreneurs. But we, we, it was a lesson for me. It was a really good lesson at the right moment. Uh, because because it humbled me and focused me on, on getting the right things done, and yeah, that was my first exit actually. We, I sold that company back in two thousand four. But but the thing is that 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 was a big lesson to me, you know, in multiple ways. I think it's a huge growth curve for the emotional intelligence part of, of myself that I've been trying to develop over the years. You can make obviously depending on your own background and other things anything you want out of this, but uh, I think it was an interesting and very transformative story for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what skills or qualities would you say an entrepreneur um, would need to, in order to make it to, to be a successful entrepreneur? Obviously, one being humble, as your stories have brought out. Yeah, um, it's um, obviously you need to have uh, some skills. You know, if you don't know how to get things together. Let's say typical failing startup position is an MBA who doesn't have any engineer friends who wants to build a company and plans to initially outsource the development to somebody. Like, not going to uh, be on my radar as an investment opportunity. <laughs> uh, it's not a very good idea. Uh, um, well, you can as a, as, a, as a business guy, you can obviously still build the business, but you have to build a business around something that is not related to any technology or product if you don't have such skills in the team. So I think it's important to have a team because I mean you, you can have you can be as a solo entrepreneur, but uh, building it as a team, it's 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 uh, first of all it's more fun, you know, if you have somebody to really share all your experiences with. But uh, you can also have much more inter interesting combination because you can combine different skills to same same uh, towards the same cause. And if you have two talented people are working for the same same good cause, and then both of them, both of the people are believing in the same cause from their different perspectives. Let's say that engineer can believe in the idea from her, from his perspective, and the business guy can believe in the idea from from her perspective, and so that this this combination is is definitely a uh, useful set to start. And I think it set up the company for much more likely success. Uh, but. Uh, I guess uh, in those situations, as I learned, uh, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the good way, you know, in early in my entrepreneurial career, you need to be able to also then negotiate and compromise on things and, and get things. Uh, speaking of the team, how did you find uh, and select your co-founders? Uh, it was uh, because I'm an ideas person myself. Uh, uh, I usually look at it from perspective because I can get ideas even when I'm a business guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very good at pitching my ideas, and uh, and uh, so uh, I first uh, look at where the idea is around. I need to get first uh, some uh, acid testing, a sanity check for 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 the idea that I have uh, from engineers that are in the same realm. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes my co-founders get chosen from the perspective that that, that I I try to find an engineer who is yeah. who is uh, very knowledgeable on the space that, that I I have my idea in. And if that guy gets convinced and that, that this is a great idea or contributes his own ideas, uh, that, that, that this is how it really becomes a cool thing. And then, then gets excited about it as well, yeah. then it becomes a team. You know, so. I understand the process because I mean, one thing is about like the com complementary uh, founder maybe and also like uh, believing in the thing. The other thing is the chemistry. I mean, is this something that like follows? The problem is that, that, that it's... it's uh, Building trust is a very long process, and uh, you cannot really trust the person on the first day you meet. And uh, at the same time, uh, when you look at the people that you already build trust with, and maybe they are not uh, exact perfect fits for the idea that you have, or maybe they don't like the same ideas. Uh, so sometimes it's hard, 
Like you have to basically work together for three months before you even know if it will go going to work out. And I've learned, I mean, sometimes we mix the startup teams, you know, on the, on the run, you know, if things don't work out, then they don't work out. You just find new, new co-founders and remix the, the setup to, to fit, fit the cost. Uh, so I cannot say that I have been always successful with it. Yeah. I have failed multiple times over. But I think uh, over time I've gotten better with it. Like uh, you learn some things and you try to do things better next time. And also because of my, uh, let's say, small successes that I had on the way, uh, uh, I'm more attractive as a co-founder to lots of people. Uh, so obviously it helps. Do you, have, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you have certain things that you uh, like look especially for, like on the personality, or uh, where you would say, okay, that's a complete no-go if I sense that, um, regardless of the intellect? Uh, so right now, all of the co-founders in this company that, that we are building are serial entrepreneurs before. So all of us have done multiple companies before. So I mean, it, there's specific qualifiers already in place. But we've had our, how do I say, like discussions between ourselves sometimes, like like whether all of us are still committed to the same causes and other things. But I think it's so far, it's it's pretty clear that that, that, that helps a lot. <laughs> like everybody knows that how hard it is to build companies and, you know, and from that perspective. Yeah. As a brand new startup, um, what are the three main functions that the business person, person should focus on to get the business really started? Because it's really overwhelming in the beginning. You're trying to do everything, like you're trying to do sales, you're going to pitch it, you're trying to do marketing, you're trying to get people together behind the idea. So where would you say are the three areas one should really focus on to get things really rolling? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so. Um, First of all, it depends whether the business person is a product person at the same time. And, uh, and uh, sometimes the engineer is the product person, sometimes the business guy is just a business person. And then, so now, uh, sometimes in, in our case, I'm a product person and a business person at the same time. So in our co-founder group right now, uh, we have a business development co-founder specifically, who is not me, even though I can do business development myself. Uh, so I'm focusing on product and my, my one of my co-founders is focusing on business development. So. Uh, if you are, if your skills are in business development and not in product, uh, I think uh, the the task of every person in the startup team is to remove the friction from their own end. So, meaning that that if you are a business developer person, you have to make sure that the things that you can control, if you can control the business model, for example, if you can set up the pricing and and the, and the way that it's distributed to customers as well as how it's pitched and you know and how it's going to be distributed and how it's going to be monetized. Uh, you test those ideas until there is no friction on that front. You just work on that. And it's like business development in that sense is like product development or it's like, like uh, technology development. You develop on your own end to a point that, that there is no friction anymore. And then the pressure goes to your co-founder because, because now they have to deliver on their end so that you can, you can get your things done. And, and then if you are a product person, you have to basically hone the, the product scope, the product pitch, and, 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 the, and the, how the solution is, is going to be uh, uh, solving the specific problems and which problems you are trying to solve. And then as a technology person, you have to find the right technology so that it can be developed fast enough to the customers and then look at the long-term plan on how to ro ramp up the, the, the shipments and then the production and the, and, the, and the quality assurance and all these other things. So all of these people have this, even, but I think if you focus on removing the friction as early as possible, it will become incredibly easy to, to raise funding and then and, and get customers early on. Uh, because because you focused on removing those obstacles, right? Mm -hmm. And I think most people don't realize that they don't understand that 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 the, the, the task is to remove the friction. I didn't realize it myself well enough. I mean, I could remove friction in specific fronts, like I could get lots of people interested on the on the on the product, but I couldn't understand how to make use of that that skill that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I'm looking at it more holistically, like from the perspective, I'm now focusing on on product development because in in our case right now. We have such a long line of customers for our current current business that, that it's the problem. So I'm focusing on where the bottleneck is. I know that once we solve this problem, I will move to rollouts because the rollout is the next bottleneck that has to be fixed. Okay. You said you had a lot of um, so you have customers lined up. Those are paying customers, and mm -hmm. um, the product hasn't been launched yet, so they have no user experience of the of the of the product to date. Yet they've committed. Except for a few ones that have started really early, like who are currently on the customer development bin. But we have a few customers that are in that mode. So how right. do you, like, my challenge is I have a product, I'm trying to get it out, I want to trial it out, but I'm 
kind of holding back because I'm afraid that if I put it out there as a trial on a freemium basis, that how do you get that turnaround to become paying customers? How do you first know that the freemium is the right business model to you? You have to test everything. Like, I mean, you basically what, what we did, we just go and pitch something and see if it converts. If it doesn't, you pitch something else. You try to pitch from different angles and different... You basically have multiple different pitches that you make. And then you test them out. You know, and then you basically try to find out what is the right business. You cannot... The problem is that you cannot really ask from the customers what is the business model. Like, I mean, you cannot say that how much you're willing to pay because they say nothing. Uh, or they say that, that, okay, I'll pay you this much, but it may not be the real price that they're willing to pay. And what I'm seeing is that sometimes increasing the price is actually increasing the conversion at the same time. Yeah. So, so now... Uh, seeing those things happen you know it's 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 a pretty delicate science you have to really learn like in this customer interface first of all you have to go and pitch and say i'm not going to do this for free and 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 if, if they still are interested you know that you have something you don't have to still say the price yet you just said i'm not going to do this for free mm -hmm. but you don't never i mean you always say to them that but but i'm never going to charge you before you approve that this charge that i'm charging is is providing you the value that i'm charging for you have to say me in writing that, 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 that <coughs> I accept this because, because, and then once you get those two hurdles over, then you can start finding out what the real model is and what is the, and there's probably like multiple iterations that you have to do on the business model before you really find the model that creates the minimum amount of friction. Because some models can have different types of frictions and maybe some models work better with some customers <coughs> and some models work with other customers better. So you have to also figure out what is the target market initially. And if you want to scale, you have to have easily refer cross-referable customers. So that when you do one deal, you can instantly sell it to the next one because they know that this guy bought it. Okay, so they, it's validated. Now I want to buy it as well. You had a question. Okay. Earlier you said um, you learned something from, from mistakes in choosing a co-founder. So what would that lessons be that you learned or that ask? <laughs> So what lessons did yeah, you learn? Yeah, so that's the hard one. Uh, I've been badly screwed by a co-founder. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a Polish co-founder who really screwed me bad. Like, I mean, basically blackmailed me for $300,000 to unlock up the source codes uh, so that I have to pay 300000 to get the source codes back. And you can imagine how much damage such a situation will create. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I was blown away that I didn't see that coming from that person because, because I, I was completely trusting and, you know, and there's, there's an entrepreneur and you, know, you, you think and, and you think you can trust people and, you know, and, and all the appearance that you had is completely vanishing away and you, you basically start looking at the face of a crook, mm -hmm. uh, which you thought was your friend the day before or a bit earlier. So it puts you in the mode of analyzing and uh, what did I do wrong in the past? And sometimes I, I felt like I couldn't even see it necessarily because sometimes the uh, situations change people. So when you are poor as a startup, uh, people may behave specific way. Once you sign up a massive deal for the company, which I often did, what is like crazy big deals, and then you get the deal and the person co-founder of yours or person that is you're working with has never seen that much money in their lives, maybe it changes them. Maybe, it, oh, now I'm rich and I can do whatever I want, you know, and, and start doing things that are completely crazy. But how do you know that in, in advance? I also had a history with one co-founder where the co-founder when he got the first, like, first salary uh, from the company, went out and bought, uh, bought uh, the top of the line rollerblades with this money. Put so much money on rollerblades that he spent the whole salary to them. And then came back to me and said, I need to get second salary to buy food. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I mean, I, I, I wasn't planning for this, really. And you have to really get your shit together. Like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not here to like, uh, be some life coach, you know, stuff like that. And, so, I mean, there are things that you, that's take you by surprise, you know. Yeah, but how would that change? I mean, um, are you more cautious right now with the setting up a legal system or a legal framework um, with your co-founders? Because it's something that can happen. And as you said, sometimes you cannot foresee it. So, I but mean, that's that taken care of with the shareholder agreements. But you have shareholder agreements usually, in, uh, at least in the United States and in other countries, you can use shareholder agreements to, to weed out the bad behavior. Because, because the shareholder agreement, when everybody signs it, it says that, that, that uh, when, when something, somebody does something demonstrably against the company's uh, own uh, like benefit, you can agree to go different ways and you have a procedure how you can uh, repatriate the shares in those cases. So, I, I mean, 
there has been situations like that before as well in my companies. We have utilized the shoulder agreements to 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 part ways, and they are very good when they when they have happened in that 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 way because it gives you a legal framework to do it. So you think it's important at a very very early stage to set up, even if you don't have funding or money, to set up a basic shareholder agreement and have that legal structure in place, even if you're best of friends. Because because of this this surprise is that people change their characters when money comes into the equation. I think you should have those agreements in place before you have the money. Because when when you have the money and then you have to agree on something, everybody remembers everything differently. And <laughs> It was me who owned everything, you know, we, we didn't have any shares shared, but it was me who owned everything, right? You know, it's, the egos come in play and it's, it's very hard to deal with in that situation. It's better to put it in paper as early as you can. I understand that it's impossible to hire an expensive lawyer to put together like a complete legal framework, but at least you can make a founder agreement between yourselves in a piece of paper that says the term sheet, like some kind of term sheet between yourselves saying, that, okay, this is the terms that we agreed initially and you sign it. I think it's quite valid as a, as a legal agreement, even if it doesn't follow any specific legal rules on how you say things. Because then you can take it to a lawyer and the lawyer interprets into a real legal form when the money comes in. I have a question about NDAs and non-disclosure agreements. How do you feel about that when pitching and at which stage do you submit that, if at all? Never. In the very early stages? Never NDAs. <laughs> okay. Don't tell things that you don't want to tell. That's okay. it. Simple. If you ask somebody to sign NDAs, like, uh, I mean, I think you're disres- disrespecting their intelligence or something. I mean, it's, it's not really something that, I mean, uh, that's, uh, nobody has the kind of idea that, that requires NDA from that perspective. And if you have some ingredients to it that are really secret, don't tell them. Okay. Just keep them to yourself. So what would you put in these shareholder agreements? Uh, the terms, uh, how... You part ways uh, when when you when you basically let's say that that one of the one of the founders let's say you have three founders for example and one of the founders quits in the middle of the way there needs to be an agreement that if some any of these founders quit uh, they have to return the shares with close to nominal value to the rest of the, the other founders so because they gave up in the middle of the road uh, they gave up that's pretty simple. So what's the middle of the road? I mean, not middle really of the road meaning that the company is not exited yet and it's still under process and it's still uh, it's it's still under development. But I mean, in Switzerland, a lot of companies they never really have an IPO or something. You basically start a startup, it becomes a like a small, small, small mid-sized business, and it just kind of goes on. So there is no end of the road really. It just moves yeah. On. So at some, at some point you want to get out. Yeah. So yeah. Sure. So so uh, that's also also okay. So there's there's this so so called when the company reaches a, a profitability moment mm-hmm. and so it's self sustaining. Uh, I think it's fair after this profitability moment if you if, if there's no exit in in sight that if one of the founders wants to leave that there's a negotiation between the founders on, on how much of the cash that the company has accrued so far from the profits is is going to be used to buying out this founder and if. The two of the other founders do not want to sell their own, uh, like buy buy that share back, uh, but the person has a third party that 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 mm-hmm. they can sell to. Mm-hmm. From that perspective, there needs to be some kind of rules on the on the shareholder agreements. The other founders have to approve that that buyer, so that they cannot sell it to some bad person who is going to screw mm-hmm. them. Uh, so it's complicated in that sense. There needs to be some kind of trust between you, so that uh, so that uh, it doesn't become a big fight. But I would say that that. What I've found myself in, you know, on the way that, that usually when you have these agreements in place, uh, common sense takes over and you know you basically negotiate the deal that everybody can be happy with and that's it. There's a negotiation and obviously people will initially have a positions that are different from each other but that they converge and there's a deal. Well, yeah, just want to add on that. Uh, uh, there is another system which is best in the shares. Uh, so you can see that a period of two years and you vest the shares over over the time. So if you quit after a year, you keep half of the shares and the company can forfeit the other half. In US it's usually four years. So we are using currently 48 months vesting periods. So so the stocks. So you do the vesting also for co- co-founders, yes. not only for new employees. Yes, everybody. Yeah. That obviously because because you you want you are in this together, you somebody quits in the middle, they lose whatever shares they didn't earn so far. Because the rest of the guys are still putting their efforts in. And uh, a more practical question. You said you're uh, more of a digital person. You don't like paper. 
Is there any um, online or app that you rely on the most? There's lots of apps that I like to use, and uh, most of them are mobile. And because I'm a big mobile guy, I try to live without PCs as much as I possibly can. So I've been having these experiments that I, that uh, I try to do my work only with iPad and, uh, and the iPhone. And uh, I just try different things. I also experimented uh, back in the day with uh, things like uh, when I was doing business development, I wanted to see what, what kind of mechanisms you can use for selling. So I once uh, closed a deal only by using Skype to Korea. And once I closed the deal only by using Facebook chat to, to Australia. And it was just for the experiment of it. And it was funny because, because it, it became so much of a passion of trying out things and like experimenting with these things that, that when these guys like uh, on this chat and then things are, can we now move into email to do the rest of this negotiation? I said, no, no, let's continue it all the way so that I can say that I did it all the way here. And, you know, <laughs> like, but it becomes funny thing. Like, I said, okay, this guy really is serious. Like, he, he really does he loves, loves his job and wants to do things differently. And then it's okay. Like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, I think uh, the most used tools, I mean, we are using, uh, uh, so, I mean, I use, uh, I migrated completely out of Skype after Microsoft bought it. I'm, I'm a Hangouts person. And, uh, and uh, so I use FaceTime, I use Hangouts. <laughs> And I use uh, uh, Dropbox. I use a lot of Dropbox, and and uh, obviously I use the mobile mail tools like Mailbox. And I, I really like Fantastical uh, as a calendar app. It's awesome uh, with natural language processing capabilities. And uh, uh, we use Trello internally for for simple project management. Uh, I'm using it less than the engineers are using, but I'm mm -hmm. still using it. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, We've been trying out a lot of other apps over the years. I mean, we've been trying out Asana and uh, and uh, many others. But I really experiment with any new mobile productivity apps that comes here. I do most of my agreements now with DocuSign uh, because I really like electronic signatures. Uh, but I also have tried with EchoSign and HelloSign and some other applications because I'm, I'm looking at different ways. But DocuSign really came out with awesome mobile tools. So I, I've been using the iPad signing of functionalities of of DocuSign. Um, there's probably several more apps that, that I could feature, but uh, but uh, I, I definitely the think that is... that come to mind must be the, the most active ones. Yeah, yeah, they are the ones that I use constantly, like yeah. uh, every time I can. Is there anything else that I would say? I use uh, Pocket, this this uh, website link, uh, link tool a lot, because I save uh, lots of the longer reads that I find. Uh, uh, into local storage in order to read them in airplanes. For example, when I was on the way here, I was reading some of the backlog of the stuff that I was wanted to research into mm -hmm. uh, from Pocket. Because it saves it into a readable format into local storage, so you don't have to have internet connection to read it. Okay. So. And uh, what got you interested in, in the CRM environment, in the CRM world? What, what brought you to that? And I'm interested how? in killing it, because, because it's causing too much pain with people. So Linko is not CRM? I mean, we have to sell it to CRM because we replace CRM, but we are really in business of killing CRM. Um, so um, and why? I, I think it's odd that there's a market where, which has uh, 300 billion of revenue worldwide, uh, the enterprise software, where end users universally hate the product. I mean, how can you create such a market? I mean, there's so much money moving in with so much pain created that I think it's an awesome opportunity for me to fix. Uh, it creates a massive market opportunity because painkiller, it's easy to do painkillers in this market. So in, in short, what, what, how do you plan to solve the? Yeah. So, so how how, how it is how 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 it is being solved is that, that the mobile itself uh, is a big revolution. So, by 2017, 83 percent of all computing is mobile. Of all computing is mobile. Just think of it. Like practically, it means that, that that most of everything that you do, you do in mobile devices, be it a tablet device or be it a mobile device. Now, with this huge, huge shift from, from PC to mobile worldwide, uh, what it means is that it completely changes how we work. And I, I think it's a very, very good trend because uh, you remember this, uh, this evolution picture where people, I mean, we come from monkeys and then we start and then we evolve into the, like, this kind of uh, PC hacking, right. like uh, folks who are sitting on a table. Now, I think the mobile devices free us back into, into this moving and lively and, you know, and living and breathing beings who do not have to sit the whole day 
uh, hitting some <laughs> freaking keyboards. Uh, I, I don't think it's a, it's a really good thing that we are like we devolved into such a situation in the first place. And now the mobile freeing us back into this doing things. And, and because these mobile devices have all these sensors, uh, they basically, every single thing that you do with mobile device has infinite amount of contextual points you can add into this data point. So you can add as a context to one click on the phone, you can add the context to your friends, the location, the time, you know, the movement, you know, there's all kinds of sensors that you have around it. And then you can add a, like, basically the phone has the, the, the senses of vision, sight and touch. And, you know, like, like it's like human being in that sense. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, this whole thing then enables us to learn from the context so that we don't have to ask all these questions that they're usually asking with these forms to fill and, you know, all these papers and, and, uh, and so on. So with this context, I think it's enable, uh, it enables us to move into a new era where we just do things how we want to do them and in the ways that we like to do them. Uh, and preferably not filling some forms with, with the keyboards, but rather just doing the things the way that we want and then taking photos of places and tapping buttons at the right times, you know, on the phone, so maybe speaking to it and so on. And now this data can be utilized then in companies for business purposes. And okay. because it, I mean, these devices are always with you, right? Next to your bed when you go to sleep, and so on. And now with this, you have this always on paradigm with uh, always uh, on data streams as well available from the box. And now you just have to filter the data so that the private data stays with you and the company ready data goes to the company. And if you can do that, then there's multiple benefits that come with it. One is that. that there's no, absolutely no reporting or admin ever required from people again. So headache is off. And the management gets real-time data from the real source. And they get it because, because nobody has to specifically contribute. It just comes. And, and this is a big revolution, I think. And we are playing to this revolution. We, we want to enable it and we want to increase the pace at which we go into that because we think there's a lot of pain. And we are seeing a lot of agreement from the marketplace. That's why our conversions are incredibly high. Right now. So what's next for you? Where do you see Linko going? I want to I want to do this company all the way. I, I fully I'm focused a, on Linko. Yeah, I, I want to do it in a, all the way in the sense that I'm not interested in doing any quick flips or anything. I just want to build this into a I've solved the problem that we set up to solve. What's, I, what's the next milestone for Linko? So the next one is, is obviously delivering all these customers that are already lined up. <coughs> so that I feel that we are worth something. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, we probably utilize their value that we created out of it into either raising a massive funding run for conquering the world, or if the profits are high enough, maybe we don't even raise the funding, we just do it with profits. But we definitely will invest into, into fixing all the possible problems we possibly can from removing bureaucracy from people's lives. That's basically what we want to do. And I'm committed to doing it for uh, several years. I may do some angel investments on the sides, and I may mm. I may do some, but uh, but as a, as a, as a how do I say like a purpose for my daytime? You know, how do I want to spend my time in the in the interesting, challenging uh, uh, project that really has the possibility of making a big difference on the planetary scale? I think I like it. Mm -hmm. And you're an outdoor kind of guy, and so how do you balance work life with? Outdoors, sunshine, yeah, that's, exercise. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I so in for the since I mean in United States, I, I learned the hard way that, that even though you exercise and you go, you can still get fat very easily because because uh, there are so many different ways to to gain weight that you don't realize. So I found out after three years being there, creeping up on weight, even though I was exercising and I was eating healthily, and I found out it was Starbucks that created that problem. <laughs> I just. I just found it out two years too late because because I was already <laughs> already uh, like uh, uh, in uncomfortable situation of having like uh, about six kilos of extra fat that I wanted to get rid of. Uh, but when I found it out, uh, I, it was easy to fix, obviously. And uh, so I studied the exercise program myself. That okay, I, I want to get back to my youth youth size and and uh, really to to help. So I started exercising five to six times a week and and and, and uh, stopped uh, eating meat completely. So I became a vegetarian. Uh, after several months of doing that, uh, uh, I found out that I wasn't having any enough strength at the gym to lift the weights. 
So I realized that my protein intake wasn't balanced. So I added a little bit of seafood to the mix. So I am not completely vegetarian anymore. I'm kind of pescatarian, if they call it, <laughs> uh, in San Francisco terms. So I sometimes uh, still use seafood to, to complement the vegetarian diet. And then that was an awesome thing because I got back to my uh, university years, waist size and everything else. So I took commitment. But right now I'm so busy with the startup and building it that, that my exercise schedule is only two to three times a week, which is not satisfactory to me right now. But uh, I left my car to Finland to, to take all the exercise of walking the streets of Berlin and uh, so far it has been helping me mm-hmm. to stay active and this mobile lifestyle of, of doing everything on mobile and being able to really roam a lot and you can easily get this target of, of having healthy balance on the day that you don't sit the whole day with tapping some keyboards and do you have any funny startup stories to share? I have lots of them like a, share one we have one short funny story Good. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, what what should it be like? Uh, so um, we, I I mean, I had a I, I built a creative studio in San Francisco with a well, with a friend of mine who 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 is a lawyer. Like uh, he still is a lawyer. He actually went back to the law profession after it, and, and we had a lot of funny moments because because he's a big time jokester and I, I am I am too, and you know so so. Uh, we dubbed ourselves as, as the nice uh, partners because because I was the creative accountant and he was the creative lawyer. So like that makes a perfect perfect match for a very sketchy startup. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up partnering with Endemol and Fremantle Media and some of the big uh, big uh, big uh, media houses uh, on doing games with them. Uh, it was it was uh, incredibly incredible fun uh, for ourselves. And and that journey had a lot of uh, practical jokes and all these other things that we did together. But well, I may, maybe I'll, I'll share some of these uh, more inappropriate ones then later. <laughs> private settings. And, but, but yeah, I mean, this team that we currently have is also uh, also super funny. You know, we have a lot of lot of uh, fun together at the mm-hmm. office, and so I think it's very important to have a people that you really want to work with. But uh, we had a problem that, that uh, we had too many men in the, in the office. So I asked Olga actually to come, to come just to give some balance to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I knew that she wouldn't be a mascot at the office. Like yeah. she would more like put these guys in the order. And so like, now we are having this, this uh, powerful uh, uh, Russian angel girl who, will, who is richer than you, by the way. And <laughs> she's going to <laughs> tell you what to do. And it was awesome. Like, I mean, it has been a lot of fun, actually. Mm-hmm. The office. Um, so you came around quite a lot. So, what's your your take on, on hardware startups around the world? So you should ask that from Olga. Actually, Olga is a big fan of hardware startups. Uh, I'm hardware itself. Uh, I tried. I did my one myself. Uh, one hardware company, Nano Optics Space, mm-hmm. uh, back in two thousand three, and uh, mm-hmm. so we invented this like super cube sized uh, projection engine with which you can project a thirty inch screen out of a mobile phone. Uh, so the concept with that was like in my in my head was very simple. It was that, that that the screens of the mobile devices are getting bigger and the devices are getting smaller at the same time. At some point, the screen has to be bigger than the device itself. So maybe we'll just figure out how to put the screen out of the device. And and that technology, I mean, the company is actually still existing, but uh, but uh, but it didn't become a consumer electronic startup because it proved out that even though we actually patented the physical law of Etandu in a specific form where you can manipulate the light in a very, very efficient manner. Because uh, the law of Etandu is preventing the current projectors to shrink down. Uh, it's like entropy law for, lo- for, for light. And, and, and uh, uh, we figured out a way to do it, but it proved out that, that in nanotechnology it's not enough that you get theory right. You have to still reduce it into practice in a, in a very efficient way and manufacture it in, in high volume at very low cost. And it's not actually that trivial to get there. Like specifically when you talk about nanotech, uh, suddenly you can find out that yeah, it's it's cool, but you know if you want to make the efficiency up on this on the surfaces of these nanostructures, you have to spend one thousand dollars per device. It's like well, you can't really sell that because the phone is and so on. Yeah, and then you, if you start compromising on the performance, you you may 
then get to a point that it's too low performance to, to really make in the mass market. But yeah, it was, it was a big learning curve. I, I really like hardware uh, in myself. I have nothing against it. I think it's a little bit more complicated to build a startup in that front because, because of the bigger investments needed. I think 3D printing is going to change that. Uh, it, it, it makes it possible for anybody to create n new ideas around hardware that are much, much cheaper to do and, and produce in lower volumes. So we'll see how that, that changes the whole, whole ecosystem. Kickstarter has been a big deal for hardware startups as well because, because it has been able to enable. But I think many of these Kickstarter campaigns that are, that are out there may fail. And if, if there's enough failures that people paid money and then they don't get the devices, there may be some backlash. We'll see how that plays out. But uh, so far, the companies that have been doing this fundraising have been actually already ready with the product and they just wanted to get the initial orders from it. So I think it, those, those cases, it will succeed. Any last questions? Okay, so uh, uh, do you have any advice for someone who wants to look for other founders, but it's not the person who has the idea? You know? Uh, Can you if imagine? you don't have an idea, but you want to join, you have to bring something to the table. So yeah, you but have to find first them. you have to find them. Where to find them? Well, uh, You can find them from the places where, I mean, you have to at least have some idea what you are trying to look for. So you have to have some, if you don't have any specific passion for any, any specific cause, or let's say that you, you are passionate about uh, mobile, or you are passionate about uh, uh, like gadgets, or you're passionate about uh, uh, building a service business in that. If you have some passion in some specific field, then you start looking for ideas people from that front, and you will find the networking venues based on that. If you don't have any of those, I don't think you are committed enough for the entrepreneurial idea yet, because because I mean, if you just want to be entrepreneur because it sounded cool to be entrepreneur, I, I, it's not enough. There has to be passion, real passion. I have a question about exit strategies. So, a lot of these pictures, if the, in the pictures, you have to have one slide or one thing about exit, and in most cases, and especially in my case. It's such a long way away and I have no idea, number one, about what that should look like. Number two, I have no idea how to do an evaluation on something that hasn't really even... Well, you, basically, if, you, if you're really pitching to really savvy, savvy uh, investors, um, what you say is that like, you have the exit slide and the exit slide says that, that fuck everybody, we are going to be the biggest company on the planet and buy everybody else out. <laughs> <laughs> then that is, they know that you are committed to your cause. I mean... <laughs> If you make yourself the most attractive company on the, on the town, you know, people will buy it. If they don't buy it because you want to sell. If you have to sell and they don't want to buy at the same time, it's actually a pretty bad situation to sell. Right. You much rather say everybody, so the middle finger to everybody, and then they really want to buy you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and maybe a question also on fundraising. So would you say you would rather bootstrap as much as you can as a startup or uh, when you pitch for uh, investments, you try to get as much as you can? Well, I mean, I think I think there's a, there's a delicate balance between the between the, the health of the company and the control of the company in the sense that the financial health is very important because if you can't pay your bills or if you have to put up too long, uh, it slows down your development and it may be difficult to then compete in the marketplace. Uh, at the same time, if you get funding with very bad terms, you know, because because you haven't removed the friction yet. Uh, from that perspective, then the problem is that if you lose the control and somebody else tells you what to do with the company, then it may also break up the whole thing. Uh, I've learned, I mean, I've been seeing both, both situations in my previous startup, so I, I definitely know what it is. Right now, I'm really focused uh, on spreading the, spreading the wealth for, between the folks who are really contributing to this, but at the same time, keeping the control. So we have share structures that, that give uh, most of the votes to me and my another co-founder. And the reason is that we have 10x, uh, like Mark Zuckerberg has in Facebook. The reason is that it actually protects even my co-founders in, in, in difficult situations because, because I can both watch for them. Uh, so it's good to have a structure where there's very clear where the decision making is eventually ending up to. And I wouldn't ever give it to VCs. From an earlier stage, I think a lot of people, I've noticed at least here in the Swiss startup scene, are looking at an even earlier stage. So even one or two, maximum three co-founders. Um, I guess to the original question, you have your idea, you have a business plan, you might even have a 
basic prototype or, or um, a design for what it is, do you start off with funding or do you start off bootstrapping? Uh, so, I mean, if you, uh, so our initial angel run, we did, I mean, we funded obviously part of the development ourselves, but the reason why we did this was that we wanted to have a, a network of people who can help us uh, help us uh, pitch it uh, all over the world. So we made advisory agreements with every one of the angels that they have to also commit their time, not only money. And, and all of those people were successful people, salespeople, from different corners of the planet, from different disciplines of sales. The whole point was that we did not get only money, but we actually got a lot of expertise in the, in, in the sales included into the team. And now, one by one, because we are being successful with the company, they are joining us. So I already have a worldwide sales network in place. <laughs> That's easy. Like they already shareholders, even better. <laughs> Um, you talked a lot about emotional intelligence and I think here we're in an environment where people are quite focused on process, structure, knowledge, experience. But I just wondered how much you would say intuition has played a part in your success. That human element. Well, I mean, it, uh, at the end, you know, most of the big successes that happen, they, you cannot predict who they happen to. I mean, there's definitely an element of luck to everything you. And I have had my share of bad luck. I have also had good luck. And initially it evens out in a way that you have, like when you, when you go in the corporate life, your roller coaster is like this. You never have really big excitement moments, but you never have really bad times either. Then you go to entrepreneurial, initially it goes like boom, boom. And then... Once you've done it for a while, then you realize that why do I take this so seriously? Like, why am I getting so depressed and so excited about these things? Maybe I'll just even it out. And then all these big swings become more like, a, you know, it's not that anymore that big deal, you know. You get huge success and you are like, yes, but you are not like getting ahead of yourself. Because, because oftentimes when you get a big success, the next day you get bad news from somebody else. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of uh, bad news that, that are always delivered to everybody. Like, and, and so I respect that. I mean, from the perspective that, just think of it, you have limited amount of days in your life and uh, you never know when you get cancer or get sick or something else and you can never predict that. So better enjoy the days that you have. Uh, one of the things I did with my first startup when I studied it was, was that I wanted to feel the freedom of being, being on my own. Uh, so first of all, I knew that I, will, I was responsible for myself for, of, of, of my success after that. So I, I practiced in front of Miller saying that you are such a bad guy. Like, I, mean, I mean, that happened obviously after this episode of, uh, episode of uh, which I explained before, like uh, having these humbling moments of, of getting out of this, how does it like a uh, uh, young and arrogant uh, MBA mode into, into really a humble down entrepreneur. And... But I've done lots of exercises of, of pitching to myself, like, like uh, what do you need to learn from this and what did I do wrong and, you know, how can I improve things? Uh, but uh, at the same time, I wanted to also get the freedom of feeling like I'm on my own. So I stopped using alarm clock completely for the first year. Uh, so I just woke up when I woke up. And usually I realized that I started waking up between 7 and 9 in the morning. And it started over time. Uh, getting getting quite uh, uh, how to say like exactly a specific moment. So I stand in that my body woke me up like seven forty five every morning or seven fifty between very accurately. But it was always the wake up moment felt like I woke up because I was not any more tired and I, I felt good about waking up. And that little thing, just by waking up when I felt good at waking up, was was incredibly powerful and empowering. Because. Uh, uh, it's not like I, I had to have this alarm clock because somebody forced me to get the job at a specific moment of time. It's more like I wake up because I felt good about waking up. Did you just put all your meetings in the afternoon? So you didn't yeah, I, I never had meetings before then because, because of that, so that I had this flexibility in the morning. But I also found out that I never slept, like even when I didn't have alarm clock uh, before, uh, beyond nine. It was impossible for me to sleep beyond. It's just my body that worked that way. Maybe with some people you have to have at least three weeks of vacation in the middle to test it out first before you do that. So. <laughs> well, that's been very nice having you, Miko. It's been very inspiring and refreshing, and I think everyone had some interesting questions as well and got some really nice feedback. 
So thank you very much.